think that's where a lot of people go go bad with a pup. They throw them in a pen and just throw feed to them every day. And to me, you got to make a connection with them. Some guys don't agree with me on that, but I think you got to have a good bond with a dog. It's real simple, I think, with a pup, and a lot of people don't understand it. When a pup is ready to start, it will start. You can't force a pup to start, and you can't force a pup to treat. It has to do it on its own. Welcome to the Stark Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Stark. In today's episode, I'm going to cover the journey of my blue tick named Tony. I own him. He's not owned by anyone else. He's my blue tick, and I've raised him since he was a puppy. I picked him out out of the litter, and I'll just kind of discuss the journey of how I picked him and how I trained him and what he's doing now and that whole process. And some of you on Patreon have submitted questions in the Q&A portion, and at the end, I'll go over those. So just to start off, Tony is off of Country Club and one of Matt Lingo's females named Hurry. And Country Club is a Grand Knight Champion Hall of Fame Blue Tick off of Big Country. And I'm sure most of you have heard of those dogs. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with both those dogs. And I've made some videos of Country Club. He's a really nice blue tick. He is owned by Matt Lingo and Terry Tappy. A little over a year ago now, I got together with them to make a video of Country Club, my pup's dad. And just throughout the night, pleasure hunting, got to talking about how when I was a kid, we had blue ticks, and Dad really, he hunted anything that would tree and hunt the way you wanted. It didn't matter what breed it was, so we had a little bit of everything growing up, and I just got to saying how it had been at least 15 years since I've had a quality blue tick of my own, and just kind of got talking about them breeding dogs in the future, and I decided after I saw how Country Club hunted, I was going to be interested in a pup off of him, because his hunt style and his mouth and his build is Really what I like in any dog, but especially a blue tick. Country Club is a pretty big, houndy, loud, accurate coon dog. And he's great to look at, great to listen to. And when he trees, he has a coon. So that's a good combination. And really what most people are after, no matter what breed they're hunting. So after that night, we finished up hunting. We stayed in touch. So once they made the cross and the pups were ready to go, Matt contacted me. And I drove over to his place. And they had the pups in a really nice pen inside. And really just by looks, it was going to be a hard decision on which one to pick because they were all really big, pretty, healthy pups. That was probably one of the prettiest, healthiest litters I've ever seen. When I got there, Matt's wife got them out of the pen and let them loose in the yard for me so I could see kind of just how they acted. And the blue tick that I picked, he went off on his own, went off towards the woods smelling around and didn't really want to be caught or messed with. He was just off exploring. And the other two, they acted good. They were just kind of hanging around us a little bit more. So I decided to pick the one that was off exploring. And I made a decision to pick that pup that was more bold and outgoing because I can always teach one to come to me and handle well. It's To me, it's really hard to make one get going. I don't like messing with dogs that you have to beg to hunt. So if one is just naturally wants to go and explore and have more natural characteristics, that's kind of what I look for in a pup. And really, when you're picking a puppy, it's there's no science to it. The other one's left there. I could have picked one of them and they might have turned out to be the same or better, but I was really excited from the day I got him because anytime I travel any distance really, I have a Chrysler 200 car that I drive because it gets about 30 miles to the gallon, which is way better than what my truck gets. So I have a Zep single hole dog box I just put in the back seat and I put him back there in that single hole dog box and you know how it is hauling puppies. They usually just bark and squeal the whole time they're away and he never made a peep and he didn't get sick in the box and he was just super intelligent acting and he really impressed me and and I already planned on raising him how I raised Jax my mountain cur when the opportunity allows me and it's my own dog and we have the opening in our house I prefer to raise my hunting dogs in the house and get them house broken and crate trained and understanding basic obedience and I think it just helps them mentally develop a lot better than just putting them outside in a pen or something so that was my plan we were going to keep him in the house so it was my plan just keep him in the house because I've had a lot of success doing that with dogs, either permanently leaving them in the house as like a house dog slash hunting dog, or just starting them off that way and then transitioning them outside later on in life. And within a week, he was housebroken and house trained. He was just a little, little puppy, and if he needed to go out, he'd go stand by the back door, 
and we'd go pick him up and take him out back. This was before our yard was fenced in, and we'd just let him loose in the backyard, and he'd go and do his business, and he'd come back and pick him up and bring him back inside. And when you're doing that, just make sure that you control their feeding and when you water them and just monitor when they eat and drink. That way you can pay more attention and prevent accidents. And really, if you've been around dogs very much, especially puppies, when they start smelling around and looking around, there's a difference in their demeanor and how they act when they're about to go to the bathroom. So when you see that, just go take them outside, put them in the same spot, just build a routine and do it over and over again. And if they have any brains at all, they'll just kind of do it on their own eventually. And it's funny because Tony now, he's 15 months old now, and when he goes, he's he's a giant dog, and when he goes to the door to ask to go out, he is his head is above the doorknob, so when he needs to go out, he just bops his nose on the doorknob. It's pretty funny. Um, my wife joked about putting a bell by the back door just so he can go back there and ring the bell, but um, that's just kind of what he does now. But th- we raised him in the house, like I was saying earlier, so we got him housebroken, we just taught him his name, basic obedience stuff. Um, worked on him with the leash in the yard. And when he was young, I was in the process of fencing in our yard. So my backyard's about three acres, and it's got some trees in it. And I fenced it all in. That way I can just let pups run loose. So he spent a lot of time either in the house or running loose in the yard. So at night, he'd sleep in bed with us. And in the morning, he'd go outside and get exercise and explore and just kind of develop. And then in the evenings, or if we're going somewhere, we'd bring him in the house. And really, when you spend that much time with them, the hunting part comes easy because a lot of people, they just get a pup and put it in a kennel or tie it up. And it just kind of sits there and it doesn't really know its name and it has no idea how to deal with people and doesn't really know how to be outside on its own. So if you raise one, kind of how I'm saying, when you take it to the woods, you're not fighting it on a lead. You're not fighting with it to get it to load. You're not just confusing it. It's it's completely natural to them at that point because if they're just running loose in the yard where there's trees and they know their name and they're very socialized with people, they just have a better demeanor overall. They're usually smarter. Further, they usually start, in my experience, they start a lot earlier. Um, They're not as quirky or shy. They're just a lot better socialized, just like people. If you would just take a kid and put him in a room and not really socialize or put him around people, he'd grow up to be a little awkward. Really, in my experience, it's a really good thing just to socialize with them. And even if you're not interested in having one as a house dog, um, if you're training one and maybe if you want to sell it later on, if you want a dog to perform well, you don't want it to be quirky and you don't want it to be awkward because especially with competition hunting or if you're going to sell a dog or if you're going to be hunting with other people, any change like that can really screw with a dog's mind if they're not really well socialized and used to it. So I think the more you can get them around people or different experiences, especially at an early age, the better. So that's just kind of what I did early on in his development. And really for the first few months of his life, that's really all we did. I don't do a ton of hide work or cage stuff. I just kind of let him be a pup and learn and enjoy that time with them and play with them. And it was about a year ago at this time, I was on my yearly South Carolina trip and my wife was watching the dogs. And when I was gone during the day when my wife would go to work, she'd put him in the kennel in our pole barn. And multiple times she got home from work and went out to the pole barn and he would just loose and the door was open. So this is how smart this dog was. He watched us open and close that door and would use his paw and lift open the latch and let himself out. He did that like two or three times. At first we thought maybe my wife just accidentally didn't latch the door, but then we know he was actually opening the door himself. We had to get like a snap off a lead and actually hook it shut so he couldn't open it. So that's just another example of how smart some of these dogs can be, especially when you spend time with them and they really start paying attention to people and human nature and how to interact with you and read you. And that also is a very good thing to have when you're correcting a dog once it starts hunting and it, maybe it makes a mistake. You don't really have to do hardly anything besides give them a stern look if they're really smart And if they've been around you, they know when you're upset with them. You don't need to go overboard. And it's just a more enjoyable experience for you and the dog in general. So once he was about five months or so, um, I noticed he started really checking trees and stuff in the yard. So that was encouraging. And then he ended up treeing some stuff in the yard. And really, once a dog starts treeing stuff in the yard, um, no matter really what it is, he starts showing that he understands to bark at stuff and bark up and actually tree Once they start doing that, and once Tony started doing that, I decided to lay a couple drags with him. And for anyone listening to this that might not know what that means, a drag is when you take a 
it could be anything that has scent on it of whatever animal you're after. So, for example, if I'm training Tony to track and tree a raccoon, I would take a hide or a rag or something soaked in coon scent, and you just drag it on the ground, and then you drag it, rub it on the side of a tree really good, and make sure there's a lot of scent on the tree itself, and then you hang it high up in the tree to where the dog isn't really looking at it and jumping at it, but just mostly using their nose. And I did that a couple times in the woods behind the house in the daytime, and What I usually do, and it helps get them going away from you, is if I'm hunting off my four-wheeler or if there's a tree or something, I'll tie the lead strap up to the front of the four-wheeler and I'll have that hide out in front of them where they can see it and get them fired up good barking at it and then drag it away from them and go, usually I usually go about 75 yards or so for the first time. I don't leave it close, but I don't go really far and I'll lay a really good scent drag and that time, that time of year, it was really dry out, so I actually soaked the hide in water just to make sure that there was plenty of scent left behind. And I drug it through the woods and got it hung up really high and make sure you hang it high because a lot of people, they do that and they'll just put it up 10 feet or so and then the dog, once it gets to the tree, it starts jumping and what they call tree jacking really bad. And that leads to a lot of problems. It could injure the dog later on or... It could develop really bad habits as far as when they tree, they want to jump and chew and do all sorts of crazy stuff instead of just being a pretty tree dog. Or if another dog comes and trees with them and they're jumping up and down like that, it could start a fight. And a lot of that is just man-made issues. But in my experience, if you hang it way up in the tree, like a realistic situation, using a long rope, they're not going to jack the tree because they know they can't jump 25, 30 foot up in a tree. So that's what I did. And since I teased him with it first, And turned him loose, he saw me drag it away, so now he's associating me turning him loose in the woods with him firing in the woods and actually running hard. Um, That's something that I think really helps them get going away from you right off the get-go. So I did that. The first time I did that, he went in there, and obviously he could probably see it, so he was running it by scent at first, and when he got to the tree, he was treeing by sight. Then once I knew he was doing that, I put him up after he did a good job on that, and then a few days later, I did it again. But this time, I did the same exact thing, and he did it better. And then once he treed it, I tied him up to that tree, got the hide down, and repeated the same thing. I teased him with it. I drug it off a little bit further this time, probably 120 yards or so. Uh, Turned him loose. He tracked it and treed it again. Petted him up, tied him up, laid another drag with it further in the woods. He went, tracked it, and treated it again. So I knew he was consistent at doing that. And if they're doing that, I would not do any more daytime drags because you're going to be teaching them to use their eyes and really they don't need it at that point. So then what I did from that point on, it was another day or so later, I did the same thing with them, but I waited till it was at dark at night. That way I knew it was 100% scent and not using his eyes. Um, Soaked the hide, made sure it was wet and drug it through the woods, turned him loose. He fired in there, opened on track, went in there and treed. I did that. He treated it three times in a row again. So from that point on, I knew it really wasn't beneficial to keep doing that because he was already showing me he could do it. So at that point, I knew it was time to just take him in the woods and let him do it on its own. So once I start doing that, and once Tony started doing that, I just took him to a really good woods. Really anywhere around here, I know I've been hunting these woods enough. I know where the coon live and where the best places are to take dogs. So I'll just take a young dog to those places where I know they're going to strike a coon track and... It wasn't much longer. He was running tracks, and he treed his first coon on the edge of the swamp behind the house, and it was probably about a 100-yard track total. Um, He did a really good job on it. Then once they do that, it's just a matter of time of just keeping him in the woods. And at first when I was hunting him, he was was doing all this about six or seven months old at this time when he was actually starting to tree in the wild. He wasn't hunting super far yet. He still doesn't hunt super far because if you have a dog with a decent nose in this area, you don't have to hunt super far. Usually you can go between four and 600 yards and strike a coon. And if your dog isn't on a decent night, then it probably doesn't have a very good nose. So at that point, I was also hunting profit and he was getting most of my time because I was hunting that dog for Randy. Tony only get to go out once or twice a week probably, but he's a, he was intelligent and he knew what he was doing. So anytime I would take him out, he would just pick up right where he left off. And really just a lot of fun hunting him and taking him out and listening to him because he has a great mouth and I'll probably play a clip of him barking here in a little bit. And really with him, a lot of people ask me if I knock out a lot of coon to my young dogs and to be honest, I really don't. There's a few reasons for that. 
I don't have unlimited resources and places to hunt. And I hunt at least five times a week year round because our training season doesn't go out. And if I'm hunting my dogs and hunting dogs for other people, if I knocked out a good portion of everything I hunted, I would have nothing to train young dogs on. And also in my experience, if you knock out a ton of game to the dogs, it kind of slows them up a little bit. They don't hunt as hard or as far, and they don't really recut as well. And sometimes they'll even circle back and not want to leave a tree, especially when you're hunting out of season and you can't give them something. They don't understand why they treed and they're not getting rewarded for it anymore. I'm sure it's different than it was 50 years ago because people have been breeding dogs to be natural and do this for long enough now that most dogs don't really need a lot of game knocked out to it. And John Wick wrote about this many years ago, so it must not be anything super new. But a good natural dog doesn't need fur in its mouth all the time. And I don't have issues with dogs going back to trees or recutting. And if you've seen my videos, you've seen how they leave my feet. They go hunting and enjoy doing it. And I think it has a lot to do with the amount of game I knock out to them. And in my experience, let's say you're hunting two young dogs together or maybe an older dog with your young dog. If the young dog does a really good job and split trees and holds pressure then you can give them that and knock it out to them. And that actually means a little bit more than, I personally try to only give them the ones they really, really work hard for. And it's a really rewarding experience for them. Especially like if you're wanting to competition and you got them split tree in. If you give them a few when they're split treed and they know that um, they can go find their own without worrying about the other dog, that kind of prevents backpacking and hunting together. If they know that they can just leave the other dog that's treed and go get treed on their own and get rewarded for it, that's a good way to build that. and. That's just some of my thoughts on it and my experiences. And I'm lucky where I live. There's a ton. And there are some places I hunt where the only reason I have permission to hunt is the farmers want me to knock everything out. And those places I do, and I usually take older dogs that it doesn't really matter. This is more talking about pup training and my young dogs. I'm not necessarily a fan of just knocking everything out to young dogs. And those are just a few reasons why. But like I said, the places where the farmers want me to just go in and help them control the population because of the crop damage and all the problems that that causes, I'll take an older dog in there, like my mountain cur or something that it don't really matter and won't affect them much. And I'll go in there and I'll do my part to help them out. And that's a lot of fun. And they all get to experience that at some point. I just feel that when they're first starting out, when they start doing the exceptional stuff, that's when you really reward them. Just having a higher ex expectation, I guess, not just... I have a lot of dogs, and I've been with a lot of dogs that can tree coon, but I want them to really feel that reward when they do an exceptional job. If it was a really rough track on a hard night, or like I said, if they're split treeing and holding pressure, then that's why I really like to give them a big reward. And that also depends on what time of year your pup starts coming on, too. Um, like with Tony, he was starting to tree when it wasn't season, so obviously I can't give him anything at that time of year. But raising and training him the way I do, it's not that big of a deal because they have such a close connection with me. When they tree one and they see me coming, they know that I'm going to be happy with them because they're doing what I want them to do and what they want to do. They know what we're out here for, and when I get there, I pet them and love them up. And since they actually like me and have a strong connection with me, that's all they want. They hunt to please me and because they have the genetic drive to. They, they're not bloodthirsty. They're not just out there looking to chew on stuff. They're out there looking for tracks to run and game the tree, and it makes it a lot of fun. And that's, once again, if this offends people out there, who have different methods or experiences, that's okay. I'm just telling you what works for me and what has worked for me for nearly 30 years doing this. Um, and I've never bought a started or finished dog. Uh, me and dad have just been raising and training our own dogs for our whole lives. And that's just what we've always done. And I decided to pick up a camera and document this stuff about four years ago. So I've been doing this for at least 25 years before I picked up a camera or a microphone. So I'm just sharing some of my experiences and what works for me. I know there's people with a lot of different opinions out there and what works for them, but there's a lot of new people out there or people that are interested in maybe doing this because they see the camaraderie and the friendship that goes into this as far as your relationship between you and your dog. That's just a good way to have that friendship and that bond with your dog, but then actually get to go out and let them do what they're genetically bred to do because that's what they are put on this earth for, and it's their true purpose in life. And I think we've all seen people that maybe live their life not the best and they don't really have a purpose and they just kind of wander and it's kind of a sad sad way to live and that we also know there's a lot of people out there that they found their true purpose and they live life with a passion and see the difference in those two people's lives it's the same thing with dogs and hunting dogs the ones that actually get to live out their purpose and be outside in nature and find true happiness 
those are the most loved dogs. And that's the story that we need to get out and share with everyone because that, that message resonates with everyone because most people out there like dogs. And when they see this side of it, they really have no choice but to have some sort of understanding of kind of why we do this. So moving on with Tony, I pretty much just singled him out from that point on, just taking him to different woods. And after that, that time of year, it was in the wintertime. He was about eight or nine months old and the conditions were rough. And he'd tree some dens, he'd tree some coon, but you'd see the coon in the den, and he would sound great doing it. I took my son out quite a bit with him. My son loves going hunting with him. At the same time, I was hunting profit, and you saw how good he was doing. So I hunted them together a few times just to see what they would do. And at first, they kind of hunted together a little bit. But the first time that happened, profit treed in front of Tony, and I got in there and just got Tony off and cut him loose and sent him on past him. And he went and treed. And from that point on, he kind of understood he could just go hunting. And I hunted them together maybe four or five times just to, just to keep them exposed to other dogs. And it was a lot of fun doing that. It was pretty neat any time they would tree because you know how loud and great both those dogs' mouths are. And it was, just, it was something really just to sit back and listen to both those dogs. And I hope I can look back and maybe there's more experiences like this later on in life. But... Just having that those two quality dogs at once in the woods at the same time was just unbelievable to have a couple eight and nine month old dogs in the dead of winter in northern Ohio with three or four inches of snow and ice on the ground and at zero degrees and having two dogs under a year old out there split treed with coon, just a blue tick and a walker, two different breeds, um, two different stories. One's mine, one I'm hunting for someone else. It was really a neat experience, and I'm glad I got to film some of that and talk about some of that and share it. Because there's a lot of people out there that they might have a once-in-a-lifetime dog, but having two dogs like that at once really come on, it was it was pretty neat and pretty special to me. And if you're interested in seeing either Prophet or Tony or both of them hunt, they've been on Patreon a ton already. And if you're not on Patreon, make sure you download the Patreon app or go to the Patreon website, www.patreon.com slash darkoutdoors. And you can become a subscriber on there and gain access to the podcasts, get early video access, also submit questions to be answered on the podcast, and just seeing general daily behind-the-scenes type stuff and actually get in touch with me. Um, my social media stuff has grown so much over this last year, I don't check any of my Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any of that stuff, any of those messages. Because I have literally thousands of people sending me messages every day. And there is no way that I could be a good husband and father of three kids and make videos and podcasts and do everything I do um, and try and sit there and sift through thousands of messages every day. I would do nothing besides look at my computer or phone, and I can't do that. So if you actually want to get in touch with me, you can join on Patreon. There's about a 1,000 people on there now, so that's a lot easier to manage. And I'm just one guy. I don't have like a marketing team or social media team. I film everything, record everything, edit everything, post everything. is just me doing it all by myself. So if you want to actually participate and help support me buy equipment, or if you want to just help me out, continue doing this, um, check out my Patreon page. It's been growing really well lately, and I know you'll really like it. These videos are now on YouTube also. So just check out my social media pages. And like I said, Tony is the blue tick, and Prophet was the walker we already talked about. You've already seen both of them, I'm sure. But now you've heard me talk enough. I'll play... Just a few clips from some of my videos of Tony running a track and coming treed. As you can tell, he has a great mouth. He's super smart, super lovable. He is great with my kids. He's a little bit ramy because he's still got some pup in him being so young, and he's giant, so you got to be careful when he's around the kids. But he is just a great big lovable dog. He is beautiful, and I couldn't be happier with that dog. And I just want to say thank you to Matt Lingo and Terry Tappy um, for breeding such a quality hound. And if you're interested in a blue dog that is out of quality stuff, that kind of fits the description of what I'm talking about, you can look up Rock Creek Kennels on Facebook or Matt Lingo and Terry Tappy, and you can look up them on Facebook and get in contact with them because I'm sure they'll be raising some more puppies in the future. And now we'll transition a little bit more to the question and answer section from some of you on Patreon out there who had some questions for me. I'm sure I missed some stuff about Tony's life. So once again, when I post this, just in the comments below, if you have any more questions, just comment below and I'll address them in the next podcast. Uh, the first question comes from Cody. He wants to know how I keep my hides fresh. 
um, from working day to day. Um, in my pole barn, I have a refrigerator freezer combo in there. And if it's a hide, I will put it like in a dog food bag wrapped up really well. And I'll either freeze it or refrigerate it. It just depends on how much I'm going to be doing with that dog. You obviously want to keep it as fresh as possible to keep the scent as genuine as possible. So really just it depends on when your pup is ready. If it starts acting like it wants the tree and stuff in the yard and it's starting to show some of those natural signs, you, if it's in season, just maybe take one of your older dogs out and go take one and knock one out to your older dog and bring it home and skin it. Or you can just find one laying on the road. There are some companies out there that sell bottled scent that you can use, soak on rags or hides too. And you can freeze it for a little bit or refrigerate it. It really just depends on how, what your schedule's like and if you're going to be able to work with it daily. And that's just kind of what I do with it. And if the weather conditions are not good for tracking, and if you want to make it easier for the young dog, do what I did and just soak it in water and make sure it's fresh. Really, it simulates, the like, say, the raccoon was running in a swamp or through a puddle or something. And it just leaves a good scent trail on the ground, and it's easier for a young dog just starting, especially if it's in, like, the dry summer months. Next question says, how long did it take for him to start leaving your feet, and what methods did I leave to help one leave? Um, that, I kind of already answered that a little bit. He started really leaving me well, probably close to seven months old. Before that, almost every day, I would, me and my son would take him when he was just a puppy puppy. And we would just walk along in the woods. He would walk with us. And just getting him used to being in the woods and crossing logs and going around brush and crossing water and just teaching it how to maneuver in the woods is very important. A lot of people take a dog to the woods for the first time and turn it loose and expect it to know what to do. It's really no different than any person that's never been in a woods before. They kind of have to learn how to maneuver it. They're not going to be like me or you that's been hunting and walking through the outdoors for 30 or 40 years. Um, just get them used to it. Take them out in the daytime so they can kind of maneuver and get used to it and be comfortable. And like I said earlier, the method that I really like get them going away from me is when I am laying drags for the first time in their life. I'll tie them up to either my four-wheeler or something back off in a field maybe 30 or 40 yards from the woods and I'll lay the drag from them out in the open into the woods and go into the woods about 75 yards or so. That way they're all fired up and they just want to go and go get that hide. So then when you turn them loose, they're used to you unsnapping them and then firing in there. And once you start doing that, it's pretty natural from that point on. There are some that kind of just hang around. That just comes more experience on the dog and more maturity. They all do it at different times, but that's just one thing I think helps my dogs and kind of the thing I do. I don't like beating or shocking on one the way some people do to get them to leave. Um, in my opinion, that just makes them afraid of you and harder to catch at the end of the night. And they usually just end up running away from you and not necessarily actually hunting. And that can build some bad habits. And I'm not really out here looking to do that. I'm looking to have fun and build a bond with a dog and make it an enjoyable experience for me and my kids and the dog itself. So I don't usually have too much of an issue with that. And I think it goes back to letting them run loose when they're young. And then, like I said, when you take them, Take them for walks in the woods, getting them used to being out in the woods, and then laying drags, just the handful of drags you do, do what I just told you to do, and encourage them that when you turn them loose and they're fired up, they really fire off that lead and go in there. Next question comes from David, says he has a young hound that is treeing regularly, trees a coon, but does not hold pressure long enough, leaves the tree, or doesn't stay treed, tried everything he knows, running to the tree, leashing up on the tree, encouraging. That is one thing that is a common problem with some dogs, and that is really hard to correct depending on the terrain you're in. If you live in any big sections of timber where they can get really deep on you or really steep terrain where it takes a lot of time to get to a dog, that is really, really hard to fix. I'm lucky where I live, it is super flat and it has a good really really good game population so I can stay relatively close to them if one has that issue what I do if I notice they're a more tracky dog and they're not wanting to stick to a tree if they're off locating and hunting I will creep through the woods and try and stay at least 300 yards or less from them that way I they're not paying attention to me they have no idea where I'm at I leave my red light on dim so I'm not interfering with them they don't know I'm there but once they start coming treed, I can really move fast and get in there. When I get in there, praise them up, give them some fur in their mouth. And that's about all you can do is 
try and build that habit of them going in there, striking a track, getting treed, and then knowing that you're going to be there to encourage them and tie them up and try and keep the same routine every time. And some of them are hard-headed. It might take forever to get them to do that. It might be a maturity thing. Or they might just genetically might not be capable of doing it. Um, not all dogs make it. Some of them just do that. Um, that was a really big problem from what I've told a really long time ago. A lot of people would have kind of a track dog and a tree dog, and they'd hunt them in pairs together. So they'd hunt two dogs at a time. One would run a track and strike it. The other one would go with them and was a more tree-minded dog, and then they would, they would actually tree the game, and they would tree together. Um, dogs have came along so far now that you don't really need that, but it still does happen where you get those tracky dogs. And really the only thing I've found that works is kind of what I said. you you got to stay kind of close to them and really you have to stick close to them and really build that foundation repetition that they're going to tree and then really pet them up, get, encourage them, and let them know that this is what you're supposed to do. It may come down to genetics and maybe maturity. It could be the time of year or the weather conditions. Maybe it's, it's really bad for tracking. It's dry or it's really frosty or cold and game might not be moved there's a lot of factors that can go into that so really the only thing you can do is what you can do is just stay close and do kind of what you're saying and just see how it pans out and it's interesting that that question was brought up because the the female i'm hunting now it's she's at a lone pine quick shot and drive line and she's 10 months old and she's owned by randy smith and she has that issue um she for randy she had trained one wild coon and she really is a track-minded dog. She has a great nose. You turn her loose, she's going to strike a track, and she's going to run it. And she would tap trees and tree a little bit, but then she'd get down and leave, go back to tracking. Sometimes she'd backtrack. Um, but where Randy lives, he lives in the mountains in Pennsylvania, and it is very, very difficult to keep up with one or get to one before they leave. Um, here, it's a lot different. I, like I said, I can stay kind of close to her. So what I've been doing is... When she gets treed, I just stay close enough to where I can get into her, leash her up, love her up, and just keep doing that over and over again. She's treed me six coon now, and the two times I've had her out, last night was really rough. We had gotten a ton of rain. Everything's underwater here. Nothing was really moving, but she struck tracks. Um, she made three trees. The one tree she left, and I got her back on it, but it was three den trees. But two of the three trees she actually stuck. So as long as they're doing that and making progress, and like I said, she's only 10 months old, she's young, usually they'll come out of it. Some of them, it's just confidence too. They need to understand that, okay, this is where the trail ends and now I'm treed. So that's kind of just where she's at now and I'll keep you guys updated on how that goes. Hopefully tonight's a better night. I'll probably take her out maybe for a drop or two. I'm gonna hunt the blue tick Tony also. So there'll be plenty of updates coming on Patreon. Also, I have a video about to drop. It's probably gonna be the most beneficial video when it comes to coonhound reproduction that's ever been made um randy smith went into great great detail on how he raises his pups went into cpr um what to do when there's the runt of the litter and the mom's not taking care of them how to bring them back to life and keep them healthy the different supplements that you can give them what to feed them when to feed them uh, how to check when a female's about to go into labor all anything you can possibly think of when it comes to breeding and raising coonhounds or really, if anyone watches that that wants to breed and raise a dog, it's full of great quality information, and I'm really excited to share that with you. There's a lot of really great hunts coming up. I'm covering the Tournament of Champions again. I'm covering the uh, Beagle Hunt coming up for UKC again. I'm going to be going hunting with Scott Engel again. going to be going hunting with Kurt Aaring again. And right now, I'm sitting by the swamp behind my house, and two squirrels just came out of a den tree. So I'm going to get off of here pretty soon and go get a cur dog. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this, and it's been great talking to you, and I hope you're looking forward to more of these. And like I said earlier, if you have any other questions or comments, just let me know in the comments, and I can address it in the next episode. So thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time. You ended up treeing seven-tenths of a mile. I had my light on coming in, and he had another coon, so turned him loose three times. He had three coons.